All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are talking today, The Sleepwell Journey, Season 1, Episode 2. I'm Dr. Callie Hale. And I'm Dr. Kyle Hale. And we are going to dig into, is it ADHD or sleep disorder breathing? Mm -hmm. At the end of the last episode, I did say we're talking about what is sleep disorder breathing, so we're going to kind of mix that into here. Yeah. Uh, Fits in perfectly. uh, We already committed to to these, (laughs) and I... I was wrong last yeah. episode, but yeah, we're still going to talk about what is sleep disorder breathing because I am I had no idea what that was. Um, and then we're going to talk about sleep disorder breathing or is it ADHD or, you know, I think ADHD is one of those conversations that like our kids are little, so we don't have any kids in that age category yet. Our oldest is about to be eight. And lots of people struggle with that with their kids when they're younger than that. But I think we're what I'm getting to is like that talk they're about yes. to have, yes. you know, the teacher is going to come to them halfway through the first semester and say, have you had your kid checked or have you had yep. your kid tested yet? Yep. Um, and I think that would be really gut wrenching to hear that. It right. Is. Cause it's like saying something's wrong with your kid, yep. something, you know, maybe something you're doing, not doing well at home. Cause I think so many families are, you know, relying on double income, two parents working. I think it's a real luxury to have someone oh, yeah, the guilt who can is stay at immense. home. Yeah. And now it's like, well, all that could be rushing in and like, oh, if I was just, you know, with my kid more, if I was paying attention to their behavior know, more, so if I was sad. getting yeah. tested sooner. Yes. And I think it could even spiral out of control where it's like, well, if I would have had him on these drugs sooner, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think what a mistake, yeah. right? Like, and, and I've heard before that in Australia that you, before, before a child, before a minor can be, what is it prescribed? Any mood altering medications like Ritalin, like Zoloft, like, Ambien, any of those, they have to have a sleep test first. I haven't confirmed that, but I've heard that multiple times from other speakers. And yeah, it would just be phenomenal if that was the way here. I know there are some providers. I mean, obviously we're coming to you guys from the state of Texas, but it's not a requirement. And I know some providers that are doing that and it's great because I get the immediate referral because when they find out that the kid has mild, moderate, severe sleep apnea, the options are CPAP or some sort of oral appliance and expansion obviously in the kiddos and so as word is spread about what I do that's been really helpful because I've been able to identify the providers that are doing that prior to medication but the thing is is when we're talking with these parents just like you said the guilt is immense and I feel I just feel for these moms because you're right I mean I'm a working mom I we've had we have three beautiful babies and I went back to work after eight to ten weeks of you know, maternity leave for both of them. So for all three of them. And I, I really, I really resonate with these moms that are just like, I'm busy. I mean, I have to provide. And then when things like this happen with our kiddos and we get that conversation or that talk, like we've said, this is the talk, you know, coming from the school district, you just, you just immediately feel like you failed your kid and you have not. The fact is, in my opinion, the providers have failed you Mm -hmm. up until then. And that's a hard thing to say because that was me. I failed plenty of families before I knew this big time. I mean, I, one of my biggest regrets, one of my biggest regrets coming out of dental school is telling a parent that their kid's snoring is normal and they'd grow out of it. Or they're grinding their teeth. That's normal. Yeah. Why, why did I tell them that? It's just, that's what we were told. Exactly. I was told that by pediatric dentists, by orthodontists who trained me in dental school. 100%. I mean, it was like, you, you so, heard that like it was easy. Right. So, so you have these generations of misinformation. You have this generation of dentists graduating, being told something. And, you know, just even, I mean, think back to the process of getting into dental school. I mean, to be top of your class, you had to have fantastic DAT scores. You've got to have a personality. And... Nope, you don't have to have personality. Okay. <laughs> I was no, about to say, believe, well, some I of them don't have a personality. Generically, like in a stereotypical <laughs> dentist, is weird. Okay, we're, the, we're kind of an odd breed. No, we're weird too. We're, yeah. the, we're a better. Company. I'm not. You you might, might be, but I'm not. Um, but it, you come out and you you just regurgitate, right? You're kind of in the beginning, especially in your early years, a couple of two three years out. You're, you're kind of just repeating what you've been told, right? That, that's a safety thing because 100. percent Very few things in dentistry can you say, oh, for sure this it is this. X plus no, Y yeah. equals Z. And, exactly. you, and that makes you feel good because you're nervous because right. you you get out of dental school, everything's hard. Right. Fillings are hard. Crowns right. are hard. Exams are hard. You're doing patients, everything for the first time. Patients are for throwing real. you curveballs right. every single week and you're right. you're having this time is collapsing in on you so right. fast. And at the end of like that first four to five years, you are a you typically a full time practicing new grad is a really, really good dentist at that five year mark. The first and second year, you're you're black and blue. Yeah. I remember just coming home and being a completely exhausted, yeah. like completely exhausted. Like you make so many decisions each and every day, but that's another, that's another podcast right. episode for something else. But really it, it's 
regurgitating the wrong thing. And, you know, when you realize that you've said it wrong and you've been doing it wrong, you have to be humble enough to undo that and stop continuing to do the wrong thing. And, you know, I, I tell, I tell doctors that I mentor, like, look, we wouldn't have snoring adults if we didn't have snoring kids. We wouldn't have tooth grinding adults if we didn't have tooth grinding kids. So stop telling parents they're going to grow out of it and fix it before it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And sleep disorder breathing is no different. It's just identifying what is sleep disorder breathing, which is kind of the point of this whole conversation. Yeah, tell us. And sleep disorder breathing is any myriad of disturbances in your sleep that inhibit you from proper sleep architecture. So the deep sleep to light sleep to REM ratio. Okay, talk, let's get, okay, let's get I'm nitty going to. I'm that. going to. So when you stop breathing, let's go to let's sleep disorder breathing. Let's go to apnea. That's the most that's the most common one I think people mm -hmm. would resonate with. You go into fight or flight mode. This is why it gets so dangerous for adults, especially ones that are cardiovascular risk. So you stop breathing and your heart rate's going to slow and it's going to slow and it's going to slow and you're and everything is going into okay, is the oxygen going to be permanently stopping in my body right now? Right. And you gasp for air when you get this adrenaline burst of your brain telling right. you to breathe. And your brain doesn't know the difference between that and like a bear chasing you. There's no different. Yeah. The, 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 the sympathetic nervous system response, the fight or flight is happening in our kids as young as, you know, two, three years old. So that, that part of the sleep disorder breathing is going to totally jack up how much deep sleep they get. And here's the thing. Kids get more REM sleep when they're younger, which is the which is a real active form of memory building, and it when when before they're an adult, so all the way up to almost like teen years, they're going to get more REM than we are going to get. REM is going to be the second half of the night for adults, and it's about twenty percent of the night. It's a lot more for kids, along with their deep sleep. So it's their deep sleep. Right. And so it's it's twenty percent of the second half of the night for adults. It's twenty percent total oh, for okay. adults. Okay. Yeah, but you get the most of it in the latter half of the night, and that REM sleep is really critical. And we'll talk about more of that with adults, but that REM sleep is critical. And so when you go to bed too late and you don't get to sleep the required amount of hours, you'll, you'll miss out on that and you won't But you dream. said this is for memory building. And if you're a young kid trying to learn multiplication for the first time or oh, it, yeah. your syllables. No. Your, your, sleep architecture, your sleep architecture is critical. And, and, and the ratios of that sleep that you're supposed to be getting need to happen every night. And when you wake up multiple times, I mean, these kids are waking up. And their, their, their arousals on their sleep studies are insane. They're, I mean, 15, 20, 30, 40 times a night. Oh, you just use another term that I don't, I don't know. Awake. Wait, Arousal, awake. like awake. They're awake. That, they may not remember it. The parents will never know what's happened because these aren't like, get up and come into my room. When it's happening like that, it's way, it's, it's, I mean, it's really severe. You're awake, awake. A hundred percent. Yeah. But when it's happening to where they're just tossing and turning and constantly being disturbed from snoring and apneas, that's where they're just exhausted. They never, they never got that full deep sleep in the required amount of REM sleep. So, you know, so those things, <clears throat> that's a real obvious one in sleep disorder breathing that we need that, you know, obviously we need to be paying attention to, but it's a really hard one for parents to know is happening because usually by the time they're, you know, five, six, so they're not sleeping with their parents anymore. I mean, right. it was a very small subset that are the ones that are, it, they'll tell you like, oh yeah, it's kicking me, turn and tossing, like all that. So in, in sleep, the sleep disordered breathing categories stem from little hypopneas, which are smaller pauses in breathing to full blown apneas, which the definition of that is a 10 second or greater at a 3% oxygen dropping. Okay. So, so any sort of disturbances and just getting air in, I think is the easiest way to say it. But there's also parasomnias that happen in REM, like sleepwalking and sleep talking. And, you know, they, they don't know still to this day, I will see parents and say, yeah, my kid sleeps walk, sleepwalks I'm like seven, eight, nine years old. And then, and you know, they're not awake. You, you're, you're, they'll be, they will have gone to bed. Maybe the parents are still awake watching a TV and then their kid walks in and has no recollection of it. I mean, you just look at them and they're totally glassy eyed. And obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing isn't even a thought to the families because of the lack of the education, which is what this podcast is for, <laughs> that they know that what that is know, something. What do they think it is? What, what do they say? You just got like, oh, well, my husband did it when he was little and grew out of it. I mean, I uh, hear everything. Like it's, it's, oh, I don't know. They just do it. Like, I mean, it, they don't know. They, they just sleepwalk. And we have to so put extra what, what if locks your kid's on not the door. Sleeping, like if I walk in and I see our oldest is his name's Benton. If I walk in and I see that I know Benton fell asleep in a really nice, well bed, well made bed, and then 
uh, he wakes up in the morning and the comforter is on the floor and the sheets wound up into a ball. Is that a sign of sleep disorder? Yes, it breathing? is. So tossing and turning. So that's a whole different. So they should, I mean, you're going to roll over on occasion, right? Mm -hmm. But with our middle daughter, with our only daughter, our middle child, Matilda, when, before she had her tonsil nanoid removed, she would be on all ends of her crib. She, I mean, she would never be in the same, and she would be drenched in sweat. So that's another sign of sleep disorder breathing is night sweats. Okay. And so if they have these night sweats that are happening and you're getting them up from their nap and they're just totally drenched, like you need to think, are they getting enough oxygen at night? Mm -hmm. And were they breathing okay? And, and during that time, it's kind of nice because you can go in and see if they're mouth breathing. That's another sign of sleep disorder. <laughs> Sleep disorder breathing. Okay. And if they're mouth breathing or snoring a little bit, like you got to get in there and start working on nasal hygiene until you can get an insane airway dentist. So you have so arousals. Many. You have so many uh, apneas. Well, I'm trying to think of all the things you've said so far. He's like grinding your teeth. Well, snoring. we didn't really talk about that yet. Oh, yeah. Well, you just kind of casually just mentioned it. <laughs> okay. So far. So, okay. What have you said so far? Like okay, apneas. Apneas. Okay. Sleepwalking, um, sleep talking. Sleepwalking, sleep talking. Yeah. Sweats, um, night sweats. Night sweats. Yeah. Uh, what did you call like moving around the bed a bunch? Just like restless sleep. Yeah. Restless sleep. Okay. Um, you're about to talk about grinding. Yeah. Let's talk about grinding. So, okay. so tooth grinding is really obvious. It's one of the biggest signs I tell dentists to look for specifically. So, cause I think there's like three really important things when I'm teaching when they're doing a pediatric evaluation. I'm like, if you check tongue tonsils and occlusion. You were about to say teeth. Yes. Why didn't you say teeth? I should have said teeth because it's the three T's. Yeah. Tongue, tonsils, Occlusion. and teeth. <laughs> Every single time and you'll never miss it. Okay. Actually, what I say on stage always is occlusion, tongue, and tonsils because I'm talking to Dennis. And what I'm trying to get them to do with occlusion, which is a fancy word for bite. Mm -hmm. And that was something I never checked. I never checked that. Like my funny story is when I got out of school, I really didn't want to treat kids. I think we mentioned that briefly in, in episode one. I was just so afraid they would have a cavity. I didn't want to give them a shot. Mm -hmm. I just was not prepared for that um, when I got out of school. And well, so I school, never checked let their bite. Let me stop bite. you right there because school makes treating kids the scariest freaking thing on earth. I don't know what, what <laughs> if you're a dentist and you did not go to Houston, <laughs> like in Houston, uh, the school that Kelly and I both went to, also the school that her dad went to and her sister and her mom went to um, for dental school. That was like... Uh, there was nothing not intimidating about the pediatric side of it was from the faculty who, you know, there, granted there's always really good ones and then really ones that make it a kind of a challenge. Um, but the whole thing was, was challenging. There was nothing easy about it. And yeah, you were putting rubber dams on kids for sealants and stuff, well, and which I mean, you got to isolate. I get it. But, yeah. but that's, that's stressful, especially well, when they're not like, numb. Like Ouch. Case, you had no, you had like, no choice in case selection. You no, had no choice. And yeah. so you were getting kids who were referred from other places. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. And I just think now knowing, you know, what we should have been looking for in pedo. And then mm -hmm. we learned in ortho what a crossbite was, what an open bite was, but never how to prevent it or how to get in with early intervention, which is a whole nother episode. So Wait, so let's back up a little bit because you, you said those three occlusion, things. Occlusion, tongue, and tonsils. So for people listening, let's talk about the signs and occlusion. So the okay. way your teeth come together, yes. if you're not a dentist, that's what occlusion means. It's the way your teeth come together or your bite. Right. What are the signs you're looking for with that? Cross bites, where the upper is too small. It doesn't have to be on both sides. You might have one side that overlaps fine, but on the other side, it's on the inside. So posterior cross Which you have a personal experience of that growing yeah. up. Yeah. So, so posterior cross bite is a fancy word, but back teeth, back teeth, not lining up the way they're supposed to. What about to. front teeth? Like yeah. Front, front teeth. Yeah. You okay. can be like this. And then the whole front can be open if a child's tongue thrusting, or maybe they used a pacifier for too long. So checking occlusion, tongue and tonsils every time is going to allow you to find. Well, you just said another sign. Let's not, let's not skip over it. Cause that's. I know, but I'm going to explain it. Oh, okay. Thank so you. So the occlusion, tongue and tonsils is you got to look for the bite. See anything abnormal. There should be spaces between every single baby tooth. Mm-hmm. You're never going to see that as a dentist. You're never going to see that, which unicorn. is why every single child needs early intervention therapy like we do. So you're not, you're not going to see that when you see it. We saw, I've seen maybe two in thousands of kids One's and we take son. pictures of it. We're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. One of them happens to be my offspring. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyways, and then you check tongues cause you got to look for tongue ties. Okay. So that tongue, a tongue tie is not directly a sign of sleep disorder breathing, but it's going to identify when you start saying, Oh, they are having signs of sleep disorder breathing. And then you look in the mouth and then it's a glaring, obvious thing. You've got to lift that tongue up and look for a tie, lip tie, tongue tie, cheek ties, the whole thing. 
and then tonsils. So in your real, real little kids, before they could really tolerate an oral appliance like all night long, we we have tooth pillows in our practice that I've used for years and they sleep with the little blue tooth pillow in their mouth every night. And you're trying to get them to sleep with it all night long, but when they're three and under, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And we have really, really like, we have really firm conversations with the parents on what expectations they have for treatment when they start that little, because it's a toy for the kid at first and it's an expensive toy, right? So it's a chew toy. Yeah. So anyways, those are, those are the things that I think are really important to be looking for. And when it comes to sleep disorder breathing, I just think the awareness of, of what we think is normal for our kids to be doing at night, because maybe the parents do it. It's a huge genetic component to how our kids are developing. I mean, our daughter is your, your literal twin and she's got, We've expanded her. It's looking great. But I mean, she was developing exactly like you were. Mm -hmm. And she had a tongue tie that we fixed last year. There was just a lot of things that I think had that been available to you and me. I mean, I've had ortho three times now. Had that been available to you and me when we were younger, we would have prevented so much work, so much dental work, so much orthodontic work. Yeah. So we're talking just about occlusion. And I want to keep this concise so people can be thinking about Dentist and non-dentist, because I think a non-dentist who's listening to this would probably be like, well, I could look into that. I could Google that word. But you're talking about, so cross bites, posterior and anterior. So any kind of way that your teeth just aren't lining up in the, the, the vertical way. Um, and then you mentioned open bite, anterior open bite. That's really common with like, so if your front teeth aren't crossing each other, then that's like your maybe thumb sucker, pacifiers, tongue thrusters, you know, any kind of. Uh, oral habit that's keeping the teeth oh, coming definitely. together. Oh, definitely. Oh, my gosh. And, and could also be lip tie yes, for, yeah. for like a, a large diastema, which is a space between the two front teeth. Right. Um, you see how low that diastema goes. Or I mean, not the diastema, but the, the, the tie. attachment on the lip. Yeah. Um, tongue tie. You mentioned yeah. that. That's not really a teeth thing. But so let's. No, but the soft tissue is just super important. Yeah, yeah. super important. I mean, that's what we do at, with the airway dentist is we're looking at all that stuff. Well, that's what makes us different yeah, is we're does. screening yeah. every single and, person. And I think that's important to say too, because would you, would you agree that not every dentist is created equal? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. Definitely. And that even physicians, yeah, like well, we've been to, to not great physicians right, and right. then we've, we graduated to these high level thinkers in functional medicine and these physicians that are just outstanding. Oh, just with like, yeah. I mean, everyone who's had to do anything, if anyone's gotten a second opinion for anything, like whether it's not, whether it's to repair their car or to do shoulder <laughs> oh surgery gosh. like I had last year. Oh yeah. The, well, that's a whole different. The people have... who care, care yeah, a lot. Yeah, and the sure. people and who us. are in their groove, you know, that's not yeah. that they don't care, but it's, it's that that's their comfort zone and they're not willing to push it anymore. Yeah. And to, to become a physician, to become a dentist, to become a good mechanic, oh it's, it's a long road. Um, but lots it, of education. Yeah. And we so, spent our entire twenties in school. Yeah. We spent, I mean, literally we had kids l very, very late in our twenties. You, you were still in dental school mm -hmm. and we committed, I mean, it, hopefully we've lived longer than half of our life to education, <laughs> but literally this whole time. And so, and it's hard. It's sometimes it's hard to break those habits, but we still have to talk about ADHD. Yeah. But you need to back up cause you said three things and I want to make sure that people aren't sitting there. Cause okay. this, occlusion, tongue and tonsils. All right, you already talked about occlusion. Let's check that off. We tonsils. already talked about tongue. Oh. Tongue, you that was second about thrust, like a habit yes. and a tie. Yeah. Um, what, so there's one I, more I thing call, that I'll I, add about call, the tongue. I call it a funny thing. And because I think you called it that one time, but like, if you wanted to see if you had a real bad tongue tie, you have tongue, butt. when you stick your tongue <laughs> oh out. Oh my God. I can't believe you and just it makes said that. Like I little, little butt that. cheeks on the, on the tip of your it's tongue. It's called a heart. Okay. No, tongue kidding. heart, whatever. <laughs> a heart shaped tongue. Heart -shaped actually. Tongue. Yeah. Um, so now tonsils. Yeah. So tonsils are uh, really important to discuss. So actually, if you guys are at the sleep well journey website and you look at our latest blog post, it talks about an article that just came out by the amazing Dr. Audrey Yoon. She does a ton of research in orthodontics and airway. So it might not be the latest when you checked it, but it is the second blog post. Yes. It's on there. Yeah. And that was like such a needed article for the airway dentist community, hugely needed. So we needed to be able to prove that, enlarged adenoids and tonsils and the adenoids sit right behind the nose. So a really good ENT will be able to kind of look in with a camera and do nasal scope, but we can see the tonsils just by the kids saying, ah, and uh, you know, one of the biggest questions you, you have to think about when I'm sitting there looking at this kid and I'm seeing these tonsils. Now, if they are like fat size four, which means touching overlapped and that kid is like, if they cannot breathe. Yeah. Okay. They got to go. Right. You got to me too late. Like we don't, go we don't need ENT. to suffer while we, yeah. Yeah. 
When I say they got to go, I mean the tonsils got to go. Probably oh. the adenoids too. And actually, it's important that if they do have that surgery, really that they both get done. But that's that's doesn't need to be a conversation for today. So when we look at them and we see and decide personally as the airway dentist, if they're manageable, meaning, okay, they're big, they're, they're annoyed. They are breathing in air, not through the nose, which means it's not filtered. It's not humidified. Mm -hmm. Okay. The back of the throat's red and they're just big, but we can grow around them. You focus on nasal breathing. You focus on expansion. When they get into their tooth pillow appliances, it forces the tongue up. It brings the jaw forward slightly and it kind of opens their bite, which is going to help the back part of the airway. So the way I like to say it is when the teeth are coming together and the little jaws are back, this is the lower jaw, and you put them in their nighttime tooth pillow appliance, it's going to do this a little bit to open it. And even in an adult, the only way to open an airway by a dentist orally is by the protrusive, which is the forward dimension. So in adults, we bring the lower jaw way out, way farther out than you do a kid. And you change it in this dimension or you change it in this dimension. It's all you got, open and forward. Yeah. The problem is if in adults, if you only open it this way and you don't bring it up this way, you're actually closing the airway at the same time because that jaw's a hinge. So anyways, that's information for another time. Like when we talk no, about we, no, we can. night guards. <laughs> no, I want to focus on the kids. So okay. so with the tonsils discussion, it just needs well, to be wait, wait, looked wait, at me, with our- The finger puppet or the, the hand puppets that you just did that no one saw who's listening to this in their car. Um, you were just kind of show uh, like your teeth, obviously they have something between them will not touch, which right. means that your chin on your kid will be further from their nose than it would be normally. Yes. If it and a little bit in. more forward. Yeah. And a little bit more Correct. forward. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So, so that's how those appliances are working, but they're really myofunctional trainers. These appliances, they are removable expanders, but they're not the expanders that you think. They're not the expanders that we have to use once your child comes in, quote unquote, a little too old. And I'm like nervous, like we got to get this done now. That's yeah, like 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Well, they didn't put braces on me until I was 13 years old. You know, and then again, when you're a boy is 90% developed in his head and neck by 12. 90%. A girl is 94% developed in her head and neck by 12. Yeah, there's so, not much so room. explain to me why we're waiting and putting brackets on kids when they're done growing. Because they're more compliant. No. That does it and share better. Nope. Right, well, I'm I'm guessing the reasons why it's being done, not the reasons why it should be done. You know the most common answer I get for that what, what, on the socials. What? Insurance. <gasps> it's terrible. Okay, Insurance so are we sucks. not doing what's best for the kid? Because we're not trained it and we don't know. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Or because, well, these parents have some orthodontic insurance and, oh, they're, you know, they, they only got it one time. So oh, we'll just, we'll just wait till we're going to make the teeth straight. Oh my gosh. Like when I see these kids at 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 17, 20, they have been suffering for a decade. Yeah. Why? They're underdeveloped. Why? Why are we doing it wrong? You're looking at me like I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> God, God. This is intense. It's, it's tough. This, this is my most table, passionate but. thing to talk about because I'm just sick of seeing these poor kids that the dentist didn't know how to fix it or who to refer to. And so they just didn't do anything. They're like, no, there's nothing we can do. We just got to wait till those baby teeth out before, and then we'll straighten uh, them up. Oh, yeah, because 12, you, you you lost your premolars, your baby molars, and your premolars. Oh, we don't need to do anything with that little teeth. They're, they're, no, it is, sometimes that lower out. jaw catches up. Oh, my gosh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've Oh, sometimes it catches up. Okay, well, in the, in the rare instance where maybe a class two, which is when the jaw is back, in the rare instance where maybe that catches up, rare, mm -hmm, okay? Rare. Like, I would say never happens, but <laughs> rare. What's your excuse now that it didn't catch up? Oh, well, now we can do a radical surgery oh, called okay. bilateral oh, okay. split sagittal yeah. osteotomy. Now we should do upper and lower jaw surgery. Yeah. Or we should, oh, we've, we're kind of done growing now. He's Johnny's made it to like 15, 16. Yeah, oh, I don't know. It's probably as good as we get it, you know? Well, then we'll wait till he's 18 or 19. I got to tell you a surgery. story about a kid. I got to tell you a story about a kid. So Let's I saw it. this girl. She was 13 or 14 by the time she made it to me. She'd been through a round of orthodontics and the assessment came in as terrible TMJ pain. And she's like 15 years old, okay? And you'd be shocked how common that is actually. 
got, day she got her braces off, she was grinding her teeth so badly, she kept running through retainers. Well, somewhere in there, the orthodontist went out of business. I'm bankrupt, I think. And none of the records were ever turned into the state or there was no getting any of her previous records. And she came in and I looked at her teeth. She was referred to us by a really awesome cosmetic dentist in Houston. And somebody made her, somebody else, not my friend, not the person who referred, a really thick night guard because this little girl at 14, 15 years old, who was actually still growing a little bit, um, a night guard, real thick night guard. And it totally jacked her bite up. There was, I don't think there was a... I don't think there was like a single adjustment even made on this maxillary occlusal guard. And she came in and she bit down and I'm looking at her bite and she's okay. This, this little girl was on daily Tylenol for three years by the time she found me. I mean, that's, that's terrible. It's bad for your liver. I mean, she got to the point, she sort of stopped taking it because it didn't do anything anyway. She bit down and she only hit on her second molars. Only, only point of contact. And for those of you that aren't watching, when we're he and I are both making really oh, yeah, funny both, mouth faces, like, yeah. and I, I say open, and I say okay, close, bite down, close, you know, and I'm I'm just reproduced. I'm like, this is, you know, we did our digital health scan, and I was showing her her teeth, and it shows you the heat map and the bite and where they're hitting. And then I said, did you bring your night guard with you? And she said, yeah. And I put it in her mouth. How do you think it? How do you? What do you? Where do you think she hit? Nice. Yeah, I bet it everywhere hit. It was a wedge. So it was awful. Anyways, we, I stabilized her with an orthotic. We got her, I mean, she was pain-free 48 hours after that. And she'd been suffering for like three years, but, but the, but it, the ortho was just terribly, I mean, it, she just, she needed expansion. It, it was a two year long project and she's so happy and healthy and everything works and fits and, you know, is better, but they didn't know who to go to because the answer wasn't a occlusal guard. And we, why anybody would put an occlusal guard in a kid that young? It's because they don't have any other option. They don't know what to do at that point. So, you know, though I have so many stories like that that are going to be fun to tell throughout this podcast. But getting back to sleep disorder breathing and or is it ADHD? We need yeah. to talk about that. Let's do it. So if you guys look up research by Karen Bonick, B-O-N-U-K, she's the largest study to date, over 11,000 children that have been studied and followed over like, I don't know, 15 years or something. And she realized that it was a total coin flip. It was a 50% chance that a child with actual sleep disorder breathing, which mimics these same symptoms as hyperactivity, ADD, ADHD, 50% were misdiagnosed with ADD and ADHD that actually had obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. Wow. 50%. Where was this done? The study? She's on the East Coast. The U.S.? Mm-hmm. She's got awesome YouTube videos. You guys should look her up, Karen Bonick. And I've emailed her once or twice to try to get in touch with her. So maybe she'll hear this and then she'll email me back. Maybe she's super busy like you <laughs> trying sure to save her community. She's like, who is this Dr. <laughs> Callie Hale person in Texas? I don't know anything about that. But, you know, that's really unacceptable to me. Like I've, I used to kind of dance around the subject a little bit early on. Like I danced around bicuspid extractions and I won't dance around that anymore. But it, I just can't tolerate it anymore as a provider, as a mom, as somebody who has gotten kids off of these medications and fixed these issues. And so if you're a parent listening to this, a dental provider, you have kids, this conversation's happening. If you think your child has ADD, ADHD, or the school district does, your very next step needs to be a sleep study. You need to get your child a sleep study so that you can prove and get some good raw information on what their sleep looks like and how much deep sleep they're getting, how much REM they're getting, how many times they stop breathing. We've never not caught sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea on an ADHD patient. So for me, it's 100%. Every single child that comes in with it stops breathing yeah. and suffers. Yeah. And I haven't met a parent yet that would not do anything, anything to get their kid off medications. They will try anything. So you have a ton of kids on medications, and I didn't even know this was a thing, but what's the youngest kid you've seen on Ambien? I can't tell you Ambien specifically because there's that one's that one's a little bit more rare in kids, that specific drug line. Mm -hmm. But Concerta, Focalin, I mean, Benzos, mm -hmm. nine. Nine. That's crazy. And it typically, typically it's so it's so sad, but 
And no. I and I don't shame these parents ever. It's literally no, they or honestly, I don't shame the physicians. I because I, I, I did things out of order, <laughs> like playing well. I, I just wish that they knew to do the sleep study first because that line of therapy is going to be tonsil downward removal and CPAP, right? right? Like obviously, I want them to be referring to me to airway dentists, whatever. But gosh, like the, we don't even know the long term effects of these drugs on our kids and their developing brains. And it doesn't actually make a better learning child either. Mm-hmm. It it brings them back to calm, but it doesn't help memory. Mm-hmm. It doesn't help how they interact with their peers and how they process emotion mm-hmm. either because it's all muted, right? And so I, you know, it, but when parents come in and they're already on them, obviously I don't just say, oh, stop taking that. Like I work with the physicians. We, you know, we start correcting things and seeing how these kids are doing and we get we get all the information available to the parents so they can make the best decision for their child because at the end of the day that's the best thing for that family is whatever the parents think is best for their child and but they've they're just forever grateful that we we even looked at that Mm -hmm. because it wasn't ever looked at it wasn't talked about and it you know wasn't the first thing on their google search when they started looking it up either well i'm excited for people to know about this but you have several patients that have parents that have brought your kid their kids to you and they're on like their third school oh yeah oh I have so many stories I have the sweetest boy that I mean we we've had that I have have so many it's like I don't know which one directly to talk about but honestly when this one kid came in he he came in and, and the dad really wanted me to evaluate his jaws and he's like I think something's off here you know and I know the family for so long and They'd been patients forever. I'm, in my mind, I was like, where did I miss this? Like, like it was so bad. The, the class three was so bad, it was surgery now. I mean, it, yeah, he's making the underdog bulldog face. So class three is when the lower jaw develops so much larger than the top. And the top is still the problem. We gotta stop fixing just the bottom and not realizing that we have to expand the top, roof of the mouth, floor of the nose. But he had, what happened is that early, when he was like five, he'd, he was referred out because he couldn't tolerate some dental work we needed to do. Mm-hmm. And he got referred out to a pediatric dentist in town and then just disappeared, right? I mean, they well, started- stayed with the pediatric Of course, dentist. the parents stayed here. He stayed with the pediatric dentist. But from the ages of like six to 11, that's when, that's when it all yeah. happened. And I hadn't seen him. And Did they try phase one ortho on him? Nope, nothing was done. Okay. Every, the parents were told they just had to wait until he was old enough because he had primary dentition. So it was the, it was like the most heartbreaking thing. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just fast forward the, the long drawn out sort of conversations I was having with the parents. But at the end of the day, we did a sleep test. He had been kicked out of a couple of, he was kicked out of public school, not kicked out, but they wanted to, they wanted to put him in a, in a a program Mm -hmm. at school that apparently if your kid gets put into, it prohibits you from being in the military and he wanted to go to the air force. So the mom knowing that was like, okay, no, we're going to go to private. And then that wasn't working out. And, and he's the sweetest kid. I love this family. Like, and anyways, we did a sleep study and we, and we found out that he stopped breathing like 16 times an hour. An hour. An hour. 16 times it was, an it's hour. It's the most severe pediatric case that we'd caught to date. Wow. And I had, I was, he actually went to an in-center lab study. Okay. And for that, and I was the first one to get the report and I, you know, I called the mom and, you know, she just cried. Like it was, it's, it, it, you know, she was so thankful, but she even said, why did my dentist have to catch this? Yeah. She said that. Yeah. And, you know, it, I'm honored. It, I, I wish that it didn't take until he was 11. I wish I was involved when he was five. Cause I know the diff, I know the difference it would have made. He, he's still making fantastic progress. He is, he's doing great. And I'm so happy. I mean, he's combination therapy of CPAP and expansion and will likely still need surgery. We're not, you know, I haven't given up. And he's a teenager on a CPAP. He's 11. Oh my 12, God. 12 maybe. On a CPAP. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, I mean, there's a lot we can go into. I can't we'll wait to talk about more some of these more stories. ADHD <laughs> stuff into the future yeah. episodes. Um, you talked about like you, you know, treatment a lot. The diagnosis, like what, what your patient's mom said, like, why did your dentist have to catch this? This is not something that dentists have to catch. This is something that, you know, anyone can talk about this. Yeah. Teachers can talk about this. Yeah. Friends can talk about this. And it's, 
you know, it, it's not a, it's not a shameful thing. Um, you know, but I'm, you talked about that patient that was on that medication. I, I immediately felt for those parents because imagine being a parent imagine. No, I and can't not imagine. having a choice. No, no, because you don't know. That's what you're being told the the kid needs, and you're going to yeah. do whatever you think the kid needs, right? So you just don't you don't even know that it's something else. You're like, tranquilizing it could be something your kid. Else. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're tranquilizing your and, kid to get them to back to yeah. normal, right? And if you can just get that kid to breathe well, repair, yeah. learn. I mean, I, and I have friends that are on ADHD medications that, and it helps them tremendously like adults, you mm -hmm. know, as an adult, you can make that decision for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, but, and it, and it helps them greatly. But I'm like, when it's a kid, if we can do something else, we need to, we need to do better. We have to throw the kitchen sink at these kids, myofunctional therapy, tie revisions, mm -hmm. expansion, upper and lower jaw. We are going to spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about lower jaw expansion. It's awesome. the missing link. Well, I think that's, probably a really good place to stop. Okay. Um, of course, if you've got any questions, just let us know. Uh, if you, if you're looking for a place in Houston, we have uh, a place in uh, Sugarland, and probably by the time this comes out, it'll be, we'll have a place in Friendswood. We also have a place in League city <laughs> called new teeth dental solutions. So <laughs> yes, find us at new teeth, Texas.com or the airway dentist.com. And we'll be happy to take care of you. We're training an army of dentists yeah, and we are. dental team members, this, this is all we do is all we talk about. So if you can't, you can't be within probably a first degree of our organization and not have this be <laughs> like something you think about on a weekly basis. So, um, yeah, just thanks for listening. Thanks for listening guys. We, we got to do it right. Time.